and welcome back to the Total Sucker Show. We took one day off for July 4th. My name is Daryl Grove, and I'm joined by a man whom I would not sell, not even for 100 million euros. His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello, that's sweet. I don't believe you. <laughs> well, let's, no one's ever put it to the test. So I guess we'd, we'd find out. Also, good to know where I stand in your mind in terms of partner versus commodity. That's good. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it can be both. Things can be two things, Taylor. Um, so we are going to preview the World Cup quarterfinals later on today's show. We're going to talk to our friends, the Cooligans, about our upcoming tour. A workplace proximity associate. Thank you. <laughs> we, but first, we've got to talk about the big non-LeBron James to the LA Lakers transfer rumor. <laughs> it's Cristiano Ronaldo's rumored move from Real Madrid to Juventus for 100 million euros. Yes. Uh, it's happening? <laughs> Question mark. We don't know, do we? We don't. Ah. It seemed like a move that wasn't going to happen, even as it was being reported as like ninety percent done, ninety five percent dumb, done or dumb. Uh, could be both. Uh, I still don't know if it's real or not. Gabriel Marcotti has definitely uh, written a very good article that threw yes. a lot. Of us shade onto that argument? I think he made a lot of sense of yes. what's happening. Mm-hmm. So Gabriele Marcati is, I believe, an originally Italian journalist who now works in the UK. He wrote a story for ESPN, essentially explaining why this rumor is happening. Mm-hmm. And it really opens the door on what's going on. Yeah. All right, correct me if I'm wrong, Taylor. Here's how I see it. Um, the rumor appeared in the newspaper Marca, mm-hmm. which is very Real Madrid connected, and Ebola, yep. which is a Portuguese uh, newspaper. Ebola, yeah. Ebola. <laughs> I- important, important to really drive home oh, that I see. today. I see, I see, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and the Gabriel Marcotti supposes, I guess is the, the word, mm-hmm. um, that... I think p- part of it, really quickly, is that it appeared in both publications at roughly the exact same yes. time. Yes, so it's almost been leaked or placed there yep. by Real Madrid and Ronaldo's agent, mm-hmm. George Mendes, to get this story out there that there's a potential Ronaldo to Juventus 100 million euro move in the offing. Taylor, I think you, you read this not long before we started recording, yep. right? I read it this morning, so it's a little hazy in my memory. Why would Madrid or Mendes or Ronaldo want this rumor out there, whether it's true or not? Which one should I start with? Let's start with Ronaldo. Okay, so Ronaldo, first of all, he has prior. Uh, as a United fan, it was him and Sergio Ramos. There was, a, there was like alternating summers of them saying they were interested in that move. It's a way to drive up your price tag to get a better uh, offer. He knows that there are players out there. A better contract, there. maybe? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. They're better. They're, he knows that there are... Uh, uh, far more well-remunerated players out there. Oh, so like I think Neymar he, and Messi, Yeah, I example. think he would like to balance that out, potentially. So it's him sort of testing the waters, but really making it clear that, hey, look, I've got people who are interested. You all should maybe throw some money my way. Mm. The other point that Marcotti made in his article was that it also sort of lets Ronaldo force Madrid into relaying what their plans are for the future. It sort of lets him in on how they're going to plan to rebuild, reshuffle, restack this team to get them back to, say, winning three Champions Leagues in a row. <laughs> <laughs> is it also Which is a weird thing to say about a team in rebuild? Yeah. Mode, question mark. Is it also possibly leverage for Ronaldo to make sure he has a central role mm-hmm. in the continuing quest for many, many more uh, yeah. champions? League, I think it right? certainly is. I think it's it's his way of being told, "Yep, you're going to be starting here. You're going to be here for at least the next two seasons doing yep. this exact role. And if not, then it allows him to explore other options." So if he does move on, uh-huh. if this if it turns out that Madrid sort of come back and say, I think this is a good time to to hit refresh, which yeah. I think might be true in many weird ways, that the smart thing would be to say, This these last few years have been amazing, but now is the time to maybe to get fresh legs yeah. and, and rebuild. Um what does that look like? What happens in a world where Ronaldo does move to Juventus or maybe somewhere else? Well, if he moves to Juventus, somebody uh somebody on Reddit, I forget who it was kind of made the joke that there's no way that Juventus don't get drawn against PSG at some point next season <laughs> because you're forgetting why that's even more sort of funny but tragic. That is where Gigi Buffon is going to be playing. So there's this joke that, like, of course, Ronaldo signs for Juve and they win the Champions League the season after Gigi Buffon leaves to go play for PSG. He scores past Buffon in the final. Yeah. That Ooh. move still hasn't officially happened, I think. They're they're holding off for now for some reason, the uh, Gigi Buffon one. Yeah. Um, I mean... Chesney's saying, hurry up, hurry up. I think there were many <laughs> expletives on on the Reddit thread that I saw uh, from fans of rival Serie A teams yeah, who yeah. weren't so thrilled about this news. Of course. Yeah, yeah. It's always a constant thing of, okay, mm-hmm. maybe this time we're the team, like Napoli almost catching yep. Juve last year. Yeah. Add Ronaldo to the mix and it gets a bit tougher. Can we focus on Juve for a second though? Because sure. to me, they're a team that 
pretty much has a system, right? They mm. have Iguain's the number nine. Mario Mandzukic very generously agrees to play left wing. Mm-hmm. Um, Douglas Costa on the right wing. They kind of have a setup. Someone's missing out if Ronaldo comes, right? I mean, he's either going to s- displace Iguain or they're going to have a two-man striker system where Iguain does his best Benzema impression and then maybe one of the wingers has to miss out. Someone's getting either pushed out of Juve or yeah. knocked onto the bench. Yeah, and I think that person is most likely Gonzalo Iguain. Yeah. If he were, if this move does happen, it seems like he's the one that they would use not just to, to like give Ronaldo playing time, but also to maybe make up some of that transfer fee because ah. there will be people looking at that wondering about that 100 million euro price. Price tag. That said, it's worth noting, like, I think Serie A teams don't, outside of like Milan maybe, don't have the reputation of spending lots and lots and lots of money. Mm -hmm. But lest we forget, uh, after uh, Man United signed Paul Pogba from Juve, they spent, I believe, over 70 million euros to get Gonzalo Higuain to Juve in the first place. So they definitely don't shy away from spending money on players uh, if and when the situation requires. I know you haven't seen the books, but Mm -hmm. do we assume that Juve would have, if they spent 100 million on Ronaldo, would they have to sell to balance out some financial fair play stuff? I don't know, because I also saw an article doing the rounds that a Apparently, Fiat had like signed an agreement to be the sponsor that pays for Ronaldo's wages. I believe the owners of Fiat also How do you sponsor that? own Juve, so that might factor into it as well. Oh, I don't know. He he has a special Fiat jersey, huh. or he does Fiat ads or something. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so that could play into like it as well. His, could, like all his salary is in promotional stuff. I have to believe there's some financial fair play rule. Uh-huh. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what PSG got in trouble for, was if you own one of the sponsors, you can't jack up the rate that that <laughs> sponsor is paying. Yeah. I don't think it works that way. So I actually don't know the relationship between mm. Fiat and Juve. I do know that back in the day, it wasn't Juve started as a team for Fiat auto plant workers to yep. support. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, that was before all, all of the Fiat jokes uh, came to be. <laughs> Fix it again tomorrow, if you want. What about Real Madrid? Mm-hmm. If they sell Cristiano Ronaldo, they're not just going to say, no, we'll just carry on with Benzema and Gareth Bale. I, right? this, I, I actually yeah. think they could happily win La Liga and the Champions League with the team minus Cristiano Ronaldo. There's that much talent there. Yeah. But I assume Florentino Perez, the Il Presidente, would want to make a splash, right? Lose Ronaldo. It's a one-out, one-in kind of uh, fancy nightclub situation. First of all, I'm not sure I would agree with you because Barcelona are pretty good and also won the league last season. Mm-hmm. So a ronaldo list Madrid, I'm not sure if without strengthening would be able to compete. Well, Gareth Bale will get to play. That, that's that's all true. Right. Uh, but I think the key point in the entire Marcotti article, which I'm now going to spoil, was at the very end where basically he said, I think it's either Ronaldo stays, but in, in an improved and stronger financial position. So this is about using this rumor as leverage yep. to improve his Madrid position. Or yeah. he goes and one of, if not both, of Mbappe and Neymar find their way to Madrid. That seems like Ooh. it would be a massive expenditure for Real Madrid that they, even if they could afford, would definitely attract a big spotlight from any sort of entity involved in investigating fair play. <laughs> but I think that I think his point is valid, that you can't, get rid of Ronaldo and potentially get rid of Benzema or Bale and then not replace them with similarly, like, uh, what's the word? High wattage? Yes, exactly. Similar Galacticos, basically. You have to have those replacements <laughs> non-eco-friendly ready. Non-eco-friendly lights. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You've got to find a way to replace him so that fans don't see you get rid of Ronaldo and Benzema and then promote to academy players. There you go. Yeah. Uh, no more Pavons. Remember the Zidans and the Pavons? I mean, I remember the, the Zidans. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so that was a quick dip into Transfer Rumor Worlds, which will be upon us after the World Cup. If you're a new listener, you just found us during the World Cup. We don't just do this all the time during the World Cup. We do this five days a week, even when the World Cup's not happening. Mm -hmm. So stick with us after the World Cup. Get ready to get down and dirty in the Transfer Rumor mud with us. Uh huh. I'm uh-huh. just I'm just realizing. Well, oh, I just realized that number one, the transfer rumor mud is never fun. But number two, I, he may already have a fashion line, but there's no way he lives in northern Italy and doesn't launch his own fashion line. So oh, if he CR7, moves to Juve, yeah. get ready for that one. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, 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 you're right because he already has like CR7 with Nike, doesn't he? But yeah. he'll have a whole new line of, I don't know. Something fancy and shiny. Fiat cars. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's actually talk World Cup. Court Diamond finals. encrusted Fiat. <laughs> Quarterfinals are coming. That sounds far-fetched enough to be true. Oh, yeah. Quarterfinals are coming. Um, Friday's quarterfinals, I have my days of the week right, right, are Uruguay Time is v meaningless. France. Uruguay v France, 10 a.m. Fox Sports 1 on Friday, 2 p.m. Fox Sports 1 Eastern, uh, Brazil versus Belgium. And I'm really excited to talk about those games, but first I have to say, the World Cup, 
like having a break on July 4th was welcome but equally confusing because Why is that? I just assumed it was Saturday. Like I really did because of the schedule because we finally had like another day off. Yeah. I, everybody was home and doing stuff. So I was like, oh, it must be a Saturday. So then when I would like go to the local shop – and it was closed, I would be very confused why it was closed on a Saturday, <laughs> forgetting that it was July 4th on a Wednesday. Well, welcome back to the studio. Yeah, it's a little weird. <laughs> All right, shall we preview this quarterfinal? Sure. First up, Uruguay v. France, the 10 a.m. quarterfinal mm-hmm. on Friday. I've got team news for you. Yep. Edison Cavani... It looks like for all the world that he is out with a calf problem. Mm-hmm. Every story I've read is very pessimistic about Cavani's chances of playing mm-hmm. in this game. I would bet he's not even named to the bench. He may be in that sort of Luis Suarez at the Centenario. Oh, they have previous where, where he yes. wasn't named to the bench and they tried to bring him on in desperation. Yeah. And then well, no, I think he tried to bring himself on yeah. and got very mad when yeah. he wasn't eligible. Paperwork said no, right? So maybe they, won't, said no. maybe they won't rule him out for that reason. <laughs> but yes, I, I believe at best he'll be on the bench, he, Cavani. And I'll say all four of the teams we're about to talk about, I dubbed this preview uh, the round where Taylor is happy he's not a manager. Obviously, it would be nice to make that money and to be a manager at the World Cup. But every single one of these sides has a a major issue that yep. they need to deal with or find a way around. It's either an injury or a suspension yep. or um, a problem that was uncovered in a previous game, Pretty isn't much. it, Roberto Martinez? Yep. Um, all right, let's stick with Uruguay, France. Here's why Cavani's a big miss. It's the partnership with Suarez, yep. right? So far, Uruguay have able to, been able to do a sort of 4-4-2, and you could call this four midfielders, maybe a diamond, maybe a 1-3, but four, four midfielders, and... Mm. Um, with just Suarez and Cavani doing that nice weird thing where Suarez mostly stays high and Cavani floats all kinds of underneath him. And they have that connection across the field, even though they're not next to each other. Right. They're the only strike partnership in the world where they don't have to be close to each other to have a connection. The, yeah. the first goal in the round of 16 game where they do a 1-2 from right to left <laughs> and into the box is maybe the best example. It's a, it might be the longest distance 1-2 I've ever seen. <laughs> right? uh, yeah, and I think our friend and yours, Henry Bushnell uh, for Yahoo, Yahoo Sports was saying that like they're not Uruguay is not a two man team, mm-hmm. and then I forget how he c- concluded that, but the implication was or the basically sentiment was that it's not just about those two, but it also those two are your biggest threats, and they're the yeah. ones who can kind of pop up at any given moment and create something out of nothing. They're the very expensive cherry on top of a very well constructed cake. Sure, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> to use a weird food. Moment. I would say like a, a very like standard but good. Cake, yeah, and yeah. then they're the like very exciting flourish on the top <laughs> that gives it an extra level of flavor and depth. But the cake has a very good base in mm-hmm. Godin and Jimenez. You're not right? wrong. The, really, um, the flavor. I don't, I don't think I want to eat a cake that's based on Diego Godin. <laughs> but the flavor of the cake, because yeah. of Godin and Jimenez and their center back partnership at Atletico Madrid, mm-hmm. the whole cake has a very Atletico Madrid flavor, mm-hmm. which is very. Um, so just tough and chewy. Tough and chewy, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that really is true. They're very hard to break down and play through. I really, really believe that. So you're going to like. A well done steak with like a very nice sauce on top. There you <laughs> okay. go. But half of the sauce is missing. Yes. Um, before we talk about France, let's talk Lots about. Lots of analogies here. Let's talk about Uruguay's um, options sure. in terms of replacing Edison Cavani. Mm-hmm. Uh, we think the most likely uh, option will be Christian uh, Stuani. Yep. I'm sure I butchered that, but I'm confused by that. That is name. how it's spelled, right? Something C-H, like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we've watched a decent, Hirona striker. Yeah, we've watched some footage of him. Yeah, we have. Uh, I think he is the most likely to replace if Uruguay go with a four four two. There's some argu- argument to be made for maybe just dropping to a four five one, getting more midfielders in there and causing more problems. I- again, I'm a big proponent of sticking with what's been working. So I think you put somebody in who is the best replacement for Cavani that you might mm-hmm. have. Certainly not at the level of Edson Cavani, but I think he's the one who can do the most similar work that Cavani yep. would be doing. So we watched a lot of Stuani highlights, mm. and I don't think it was any coincidence that despite scoring quite a few goals for Hirona in La Liga last year, not like mind-blowing I think, goals. I think 15 goals. Yeah, but that's season. respectable yeah. return. It's more than we would score in La Liga, even between us, right? Yes. Um, a lot of the yeah. highlights were of his defensive work, mm-hmm. right? He's a big unit. He's like six foot one, kind of big, solidly built guy, um, and he's willing to tackle from the front, right? And he only has, he's not very fast, he only has one move. It's the the shimmy, like right foot, left foot thing that, that he does. And he's pretty decent in the air, right? Mm-hmm. So that's like 50% of a Cavani yep. that you've got there. Mm-hmm. I think that's what you go with. I think it is too. I still think, and I'm going to make a declaration similar to what I made against Sweden, Switzerland, and then I will hope to be wrong. 
I think this game will be one of the more frustrating games of this round. Plus, you got Suarez winning sneaky free kicks all over the place. So this gets us to France, yes. right? France were... Well, well it, so, sort of. Just to say about Uruguay, it's also because I think, uh, as we saw against Argentina, if you play a high line, or with Argentina, if you play a high line or if you leave space, France are more than capable of exploiting that. And we've seen Diego Godin wanting to go on those kind of run-throughs to help facilitate the attack. I don't know if you can afford to have him vacate space and leave opportunities. He only does that against weaker opposition, right? So then I think he doesn't help jumpstart attacks the way they've seen in other games this tournament. Mm -hmm. Then you don't have Cavani, so I would expect a very defensive Uruguay who break occasionally. And even when they break, they don't send many people forward. And here's the interesting thing as that relates to France, right? Uh Everyone's pretty up on France after that Argentina game. But that's because Argentina played nice and open. Yep. They really like went all out attack and invited France to come pouring through. Invited Kylian Mbappe uh, pace with a plan counterattacks, as we called it. Uruguay are the exact opposite. Uruguay are going to present France with a problem of we're in this solid block of two fours and uh, two strikers who are going to work hard to you know stop you playing through. Mm. And it's going to be your problem to try and break us down. We have seen time and time again, France not good at doing that. So this is a huge test for France. I would say, like, if you think about what Spain did against Russia, where it was Mm -hmm. pass on pass on pass on pass, and they never really tried to play that through ball to find the feet of Diego Costa to do any sort of individual moment of brilliance to tear that team apart. Yeah. I would say like, like, there's a chance that France are almost the opposite, where yeah. it will become too quickly about, can Mbappe dribble through three? Can Griezmann mm-hmm. create something from nothing? Can the, Giroud win a header 1v1? And the answer will be, Mbappe can dribble through two, yeah. but then there's a third, and mm-hmm. that's where he gets tackled. And the answer will be that Giroud maybe can win 40% of headers yep. against Godin and Jimenez, but that's not that's 60% you don't win, and maybe 40% that you do win, someone else wins yeah. the knockdown. Like, Torreira will be there, exactly. or my man Bentancur will be there to clean up after. Or are they headers from, like, high percentage? opportunities or is it him getting ahead to it and it goes straight up and out of bounds from 14 yards out so to me this is a test for France they're going to have to find a way to either make sure that everything Mm -hmm. connects in a way that it hasn't before or they're going to have to be really coy and maybe Yep. try and tempt Uruguay out and catch them on a counter mm-hmm. I'll be honest I don't have faith that Deschamps is able to do this the only thing I'll say is he has definitely been one of the managers that has gotten the most criticism I think some managers has been justified looking in your direction as we already have Roberto Martinez oh, I think I you're looking at me no I think it's been a little too harsh on Deschamps again because going back to the Peru game I think he game planned perfectly for that. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the decisions that were made to go against Argentina were correct decisions. I don't think those just happen in a vacuum. I think this will be a very good indicator of how much insight and tactical uh, what, how do you say it? Naus? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I never know how to properly pronounce that one. I don't either, but I confidently go with Naus. Okay, And no sure. one ever corrects me, but I think I say it really confidently. There we go. Yeah. It's all, hey man, fake it till you make it. <laughs> um, this will go a long way towards proving if he has that. Yeah, Naus. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Does he have any nous in the house? Oh, um, no. So the one interesting thing is his uh, Deschamps' mm-hmm. interesting, smart, tactical decisions with France have mostly involved Blaise Matuidi. Yep. Right. So it's Blaise Matuidi who was asked to play weirdly left wing against Peru and shut down Advin Kula, the advancing right back. It was Blaise Matuidi in the game against Argentina who was asked to be half a left winger, mm-hmm. half a centre mid and do two jobs at once. And Blaise Matuidi could do it. He is almost like the uh, the Swiss army knife that yep. the Champs can use to solve his weird tactics thing of I'm not sure what to do. Blaise Matuidi is suspended for this game. He sure is. I don't know who he replaces him with or if the replacement player will be capable of um, solving Deschamps' problems in the same way. I'm thinking Taliso because Taliso seems to be the guy that has often replaced him. It could it could be anybody. We don't it know really that, could. Right? No, we don't. But I think that who it is will tell you something about how France are approaching this game. Ooh. If it's a very attacking player, then I think that indicates they're expecting to have a lot of the ball around Uruguay's 18, and mm-hmm. what they do with it will be dependent on the creativity of the players there. Yeah. If it's more defensive, then maybe they're also preparing for a frustrating, drawn-out, don't-get-counted-on <laughs> sort of game. Oh, one guy I will have, keep an eye on for France in terms of how they're doing is Antoine Griezmann. Mm -hmm. Because the the big thing I noticed against Argentina that I hadn't seen from him before um, is he stopped just trying to be up on the defense and get in behind. um, And he started coming deep, 
back to goal, showing for the ball and connecting passes, almost like more of an attacking midfielder. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really helpful for building French attacks. If you see him doing that against Uruguay, if he can get in front of Godin and Jimenez and then maybe between the midfielders and start doing that, maybe France has a chance to, to, you know, ping, 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 Mm -hmm. build some passes, build and attack. And then you can... Mbappe can burst from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so there's going to be many variations of the teams that could come out. I guess not that many variations, but it's basically you're going to have a couple different players who could play for both teams in a couple different roles, but that will tell you a lot about the many different forms this game could take. There we go. Oh, finally, one Mm -hmm. matchup I'm looking forward to. If Uruguay do get opened up and Laxalt is playing left back, I am all in to watch a pace race between Laxalt and Kylian Mbappe. It would be very interesting to yeah. watch. I have to believe that is the last thing that Uruguay will. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Even if Laxalt could handle the pace of Mbappe, say he were a step or two faster, I still think you don't want to be into a, a foot race with mm-hmm. Mbappe because that can lead to any number of situations that yep. could be dis- or not advantageous. So foot race with Mbappe is like a land war in Asia. From yes. Princess Bride. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next semifinal. Excuse yep. me. Excuse me quarterfinal um is 2 p.m we'll get there eventually fox sports one brazil Mm -hmm. brazil Brazil. versus belgium oh what's going on here taylor what's the first thing that jumps out at you about brazil belgium uh for brazil it's the absence of casemiro who is suspended for this game that's another suspension that uh we well actually we know how brazil will deal with it because chichi has once again been kind enough to release his lineup bless him or at least we think it's his lineup thank you um fernandinho will come in uh to replace him so that is as like-for-like like of a replacement as you could have with this Brazil squad? I would argue Fernandinho is um, a better player with the ball. He likes to you know, connect passes and keep the ball moving, whereas Casemiro I think of as more of a destroyer and a coverer. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think Fernandinho quite has the defensive uh, solidity that Casemiro offers, mm-hmm. but he, he may be better in terms of building an attack and the ball flowing through him. So I think you it's like a swings and roundabout situation, if you know that, uh, if you know that phrase. This may be slightly pedantic, but that's our style. I don't know if I would agree with you that Casemiro is a destroyer, because I don't think of him like crushing people and winning tackles. But no, th- but he's a destroyer of space and attack. That's, see, that's the cutter difference, and that's why I feel like it's, that's an important distinction to make, yeah. is because... Like, I think what he does far more effectively for Brazil is just, as you said, he cuts out space, he covers for people. If, uh, if say, left, left back Marcelo, who will start this game, yeah, he's gets back. caught forward, Casemiro would be the one who just mm-hmm. magically, magically, quote unquote, is in that space filling in, or he's over on the right filling in. Or, and it's and- actually, that's worth noting that that's not just a thing that happens for Brazil. That yep. is a thing they have honed over the last few years mm-hmm. at Real Madrid, right? That's a Real Madrid connection. Is that when Marcelo goes forward, Casemiro knows, look out of your left eye and just see what's going on. On there. Yeah, yeah, but I think it would be the same case on the right, or like if one of the center backs stepped forward. I think mm-hmm. Casemiro's primary responsibility is fill the gaps, plug in until somebody else is there, and kind of shut down any sort of vulnerabilities. Yeah, which is harder than it sounds, right? It's certainly harder than it sounds, and it's certainly harder to learn in a week or less. <laughs> so, uh, and Fernandinho is a very good player, obviously, and had a breakout season with Man City. To me, I'm sure to others, he's had a breakout season many years ago uh, <laughs> before I get those tweets. Uh, but I don't know you if were, he... You brought all the Fernando stuff, right? I, You're I, like, this I guy is going to rule the Man City midfield. Of course, of course. I still <laughs> have a moment. I still have to momentarily pause and be like, wait, which one plays there still? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think he is a very good player, obviously. I don't know if he thinks to do that defensive work as naturally as Casemiro does, that's which fair. is an opportunity if Belgium can find a way to exploit it. And that's a big old if, in my opinion. So here's the thing with Belgium. Mm-hmm. The thing we, we I referenced earlier about a weakness being found, Belgium versus Japan. We did you know a good 10 minutes on the show about how the central midfield of two-man central midfield of Axel Witzel, Kevin De Bruyne, does not work because they get too split apart. De Bruyne drifts too far forward. There's just big gaps appear in the middle. Belgium fixed it against Japan by, I think they took out Dries Mertens, um, added Fellaini to the midfield so that Witzel could sit as a six. De Bruyne forward. Yeah, Yeah, and then so you you actually had a three-man central midfield. No, they didn't move him forward. They made him part of a three-man central midfield. It was uh, Witzel sitting like Fellaini to his right and De Bruyne to his left slightly ahead of him, right? So it's a three-man central midfield. I think if Roberto Martinez doesn't want his team to get torn apart in this game, he has to do the same thing. I'm sorry, Dries Mertens has got to go. Dries Mertens can't start. They need the extra central midfielder. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the logical route, but then who do you put in there instead? I would go Dembele. Okay. Yeah, I'm a big admirer of Moussa Dembele. I think he would do a, a wonderful job as either the defensive midfielder 
or one of the two centre mids ahead of Axel Witzel. Mm-hmm. Either way, I think, unfortunately, Dries Mertens has got to go. It's got to be more of a, instead of 3-4-3, a 3-5-2. So Lukaku with Hazard floating underneath him up top. So maybe even a 3-5-1-1. And then three centre mids of Witzel, Dembele and uh, Kevin De Bruyne. I would be, I think it's far more logical. I mean, let me rephrase this because that sounds too like I know anything that's going to happen. Again, this is why I dub this like the group that I do not want to manage. Yeah. But I feel like I would not be surprised to see the exact same shape, but with De Bruyne further forward and like De Bruyne Hazard with Lukaku ahead of them. So you and still lose, you to have, yeah. You lose Mertens, De Bruyne plays as the part of the front three, but maybe Dembele replaces De Bruyne in central. Yeah. Forward. And then yeah, maybe okay. you have one more in there of that's any number still, of players. That's still not enough guys, right? You no, could, but I'm saying that gives you, like you could do Witzel, Dembele, and Fellaini and have those three in there somehow. Yeah. But even then... Uh, but then, actually, you, then you're dropping De Bruyne. Yeah, then you couldn't do that. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, it's still it's still not the numbers you want from uh-huh. an attacking standpoint. I say you go 3-5-1-1 or Brazil are going to rip you to shreds. That's that's my message to Bob Martinez. No, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Any other things you're looking for from this game? I mean, I'm looking uh, Lukaku, Romelu Lukaku and Eden Hazard, who, those, whatever the shape, at least those two will start, right? Mm. Injuries permitting, no injuries that we know of, um, against Thiago Silva and Miranda. That's a big, big test uh, for that Brazilian back line. I'm in for watching that. I think yeah. that's going to be uh, good fun to watch. In terms of selection, Nasir Chadli came off the bench and scored the winner against Japan. Yeah. So is maybe Thomas Munier at right wing back or Yannick Carrasco at left wing back? Are either of their spots under threat from Nasir Chadli? I uh, genuinely, I had not thought about this. Mm-hmm. I would say it probably should be because I think Carrasco is the player you want for his attacking abilities. Certainly not for his defensive positioning. <laughs> I don't know if you want to risk that here. It makes more sense. I think to me Chadley than... brings the same problems though, right? I guess so. Maybe I just have more faith in him because he looked better. <laughs> but yeah. that was also because he was coming on against a very tired Japanese team. Uh, but yeah, I think that is certainly a vulnerability that you and I have talked about many times. Is the play of the two wing backs for Belgium? Yeah. So maybe yeah, that is something he'll be looking at. I've just realized if it's Munier. Who I'm not fully, uh, I'm not fully trusting as my defensive right wing back. Yeah. He's up against Neymar and Marcelo, right? He's getting some help from Toby Alderweireld, the right centre back. Some help, but yeah. that's <laughs> you. The wing backs for Belgium could easily get overrun um, in this game when you've got Neymar coming down one side, Willian coming down the other, with say um, Fagner or Danilo on the right and Marcelo backing up on the left. Oh, man, all right. It's yeah. going to be a lot for Belgium to deal with, but I did want to note really fast. Yeah, yeah, no di- your notes over there. No What's disrespect to, I cannot remember Sweden's goalkeeper's name, uh, but no <laughs> disrespect to Sweden's goalkeeper's names or uh, Subasic, Akinfeev, or Jordan Pickford. But I would say these four teams that we've just previewed, they really do have the goalkeeping choices. If you're starting a franchise, you want Ooh. any one of these goalkeepers. Yoris, so- Musleta, uh, Alisson, obviously quite good, and then Thibaut Courtois. You really can't lose so with any of those four. No goals all around. I mean, it, it's some good goalkeeping. I don't know who I would most want if I were picking a team. Here's my guess as well, if, in terms of how these games go. Uruguay-France might be slightly turgid for the first yep. half, at least, unless France can knock their way through. Yep. Um, Brazil-Belgium, I think, is going to be nice and open. Yeah. I mean, I, can't, I don't see how it wouldn't be, yeah, because yeah. I can't imagine Brazil going super defensive, and same very much goes for Belgium. Yeah. I do think that Belgium... They had some problems dealing with the pace uh, uh, in their last game. I don't know if they want to get into a foot race with any of the Brazil attackers. Mm -hmm. So how they adjust to deal with, like, uh, making sure they don't leave too much space in behind will also be quite a thing to watch. All right. Again, I'm very happy I'm not managing any of these teams. Best of luck, Roberto Martinez. (laughs) So those are your quarterfinals, and we will be back tomorrow. We're going to watch them right here in the office. We're going to review them, what we've been doing for the whole World Cup. So please come back and join us tomorrow. But today's show is not over, Taylor. We still have our Cooligans interview coming up. First, today's Total Soccer Show is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is when I thought we'd made it as a podcast. Really? Yeah, it's the key (laughs) podcast sponsor, right? Squarespace. But any other sponsors out there, you were also key, and we would love to have you. I love all of them. I love all of them. But Squarespace was the moment. So Squarespace is your website platform and host. We host TotalSoccerShow.com. 
on Squarespace proudly, not even as part of the sponsorship deal. We just looked around and decided Squarespace was the absolute best place to host our website. Yeah, so if the World Cup has you motivated, if you want to start writing more about soccer, if you've got a unique take on things, which yeah. is always helpful when starting a website, you can blog or publish your content that way. Mm-hmm. Or if you wanted to like be a freelancer and and like have a place to keep your entire portfolio so that people can see what you've done, what you're up to, yep. Squarespace, also a good avenue for that. Lots of portfolio templates mm-hmm. if you're a photographer or a writer, or maybe even if you're a professional soccer player Mm -hmm. and you're seeing this Ronaldo move out of Real Madrid to somewhere else and you want to step into Ronaldo's shoes which players Taylor do you think should put together a portfolio website and send it to um, I would send it to Lopetegui but I would CC Florentino Perez to make sure he sees it I I think I agree with Gabriele Marcotti which is that the two players who would most uh, satisfy Madrid fans, I think, would be Mbappe and Neymar. I feel like Mbappe, if he were going to do it, should just be a website that just has the gif of him doing his like thumbs in his armpit sort of slide celebration that he did in, in <laughs> oh, the last game. That one. That's just sort of like this is how good he is, yeah. that he's that calm on the global stage. Oh, I love that he only got halfway through that and then his teammates mobbed him. <laughs> He was, it was so good they wouldn't even let him have the solo celebration. Yeah, individual and a team player, Daryl. It's all right there if you choose to see it. I'm sure Neymar could put together um, a website as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I would edit out maybe some of the rolling around and just have the step overs and the back heels. Yeah, that's probably a good <laughs> <Yeah>. idea. <laughs> okay, what if PSG aren't selling? Uh-huh. If you were a player out there thinking, okay, PSG aren't selling, maybe I could be the guy, who else could put a website? I'm just going to go ahead and be fun with this and say that I went first last time. So it's all you, my friend, this time. All right, I would say uh, Gareth Bale. Mm-hmm. If I'm Gareth Bale, I would start a website called I'm already here.com. <laughs> oh, Play me- not, not freegareth.com? Playmemore.com. Yeah, freegareth.com. I'd buy all those domains and have them all redirect to Gareth Bale highlights, uh, proving that he might be better than Ronaldo. How about I, that? I'm trying to think, like, like we know that uh, Florentino, as with many... Uh, people in football ownership and management uh, loves a player who has a breakout tournament at the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. James Rodriguez comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. 2014. So I feel like I would, if I were Artem Zuba, I might be putting a website together. I'm just like, hey, I score goals. I am big. I am strong. I look good in white. Not a drug cheat. dot com. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be Artem Zuba. <laughs> it's a little You're on the right. nose, but. And, no, if you deny and might it, be technically incorrect in a few months. If you deny it right at top, there's, okay. there's no way they can That's get good. you. That's good. There's no way That's they can good. get you. Yes. <laughs> um, but what they can get, as can our listeners, uh, if they check out Squarespace for a free trial, and when they're ready to uh, launch, use the offer code TSS to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So that was squarespace.com and TSS for 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace, for sponsoring today's show. Artem Zuba, get on your web design. <laughs> I love it. I want to see that site now. Um, So we are are going on tour. July 17th, the tour begins in Omaha, Nebraska. And we are going on tour with The Cooligans, which is a rival soccer podcast who we have also become friends with. They're the gulliest. They they, they are the gulliest. Did I do it right? Yeah. I don't know how it works. Say, keep your friends close. But you know, you know, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. So to promote, I'm in a room with you. To promote the tour, keep your workplace acquaintances closer. The second part of it is why I keep you close. (laughs) To promote the tour and to get us set up for the tour, we wanted to have the Cooligans on the show and literally ask them questions about going on tour because we've never done it before, right? I was in a band when I was a kid. We played one one gig in a pub down the road from my house. That doesn't count as a tour. So we <laughs> we've done a few live shows with TSS but I went mostly to an academic uh, competition in Washington in high school. Does yeah. that count as going on the road? No, that counts as being a nerd. <laughs> oh right, okay. <laughs> so neither of us have been on tour. We want to talk to comedians yeah. who have done this and also, you know, get a feel for what it's going to be like when we go on the World Cup comedy tour. Uh-huh. Uh, spoiler alert, it gets gross real fast. <laughs> it certainly does. It's a, it does get a little gross. Not the Cooligans, it is the Cooligans fault. It does get gross. So Here's your warning up top. If you're interested in coming to see us on tour, go to worldcupcomedytour.com. Links to buy all the tickets should be there, except for the final dates, which have just been announced in a city that begins with ATL. Those dates have just been announced. The links are not live yet, but they will be live soon. Um, enough setup. Shall I just, I'll hand us over to Daryl and Taylor from the past as we do the interview. So we are joined by our two favorite stand-up comedians who have a soccer podcast, the Cooligans, <laughs> Alexis and Christian. Hello. Let's let's get some voice ID first. Let's say hello to alphabetical order. Alexis first. Hello. Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? My name is Alexis Guerreros. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. Very wanna, nice. Was I that don't the? Know, should I speak with this tone? Should I? Should I do this light FM voice? Was that the Uruguayan pronunciation or the Cuban pronunciation? 
It is a Uruguayan name, not a Cuban name. If it was Cuban, if I used my family's uh, maiden name, it'd be Lusardo. All right, but they, but they would <laughs> yeah. not be in the World Cup. The... No, they would not. They, they're in the world. They're in the World Cup of Dominoes, and uh, nobody watches that. <laughs> did you also? Did you also begin this with your like radio voice at first? Because I feel like you went like, "Hey, everybody! Oh, <clears throat> hey, everybody!" Yeah. <laughs> I, at first, I was like, "Hey, all right, your dial, your guy, your dial is set to," and then I realized, "No, I could, I could be normal." <laughs> and you are joined by Christian. Hello, Christian. Hello, everyone. Yes, I am Christian Polanco. Ooh. And that's uh, th- that's the Washington Heights. Uh, that's how you say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Heights out here in New York. <laughs> this is the most Sasson t- TSS has ever had. <laughs> so we, uh, we are going to be asking you guys questions about going on tour because we're all going on tour together. But first, it's World Cup. We've got to have some World Cup talk. Taylor, you got any World Cup questions for our friends, the Cooligans? I just, I'm wondering how normal people are watching the World Cup because we're watching it in a small office space closed off from the rest of the world. How have you all been watching the games? We, I've been going, we've actually been watching most of them separate. I think we only watched two games together. I, actually, I just want to, I'm flattered that you think we're normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You did say comedians, remember that. <laughs> and wait till you go on the road with us. You're about to find out just how unnormal we are. Uh, I would say we watched only two games together uh, because our schedules are so separate after once we're not doing the podcast. But I've been trying to watch most of them at bars. <laughs> yeah, I, either at home or at a bar. So I'm either at home by myself or uh, at, a, at a sweaty bar with a lot of people of whatever country is currently playing. <laughs> Do you seek them out deliberately, sort of, you know, the, these the people sweatier, are here for this game? The sweatier, the better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I want. What's the humidity level inside this bar? I'm not going in if I'm not sticking to some guy. Uh, I would, you know, it's funny, like, I watched, I try to go to, like, as many of those like nationality bars as possible, like any bar that's like associated with a specific nationality or country. Uh, but I found myself going to just random bars and because it's New York City, I, w- I went to like a, just a generic sports bar. No one in there knows anything about soccer if for the uh, Jap- Japan-Belgium game. And by the third minute, it was filled with Japanese people. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of cool. Like I basically like impromptu Japanese bar. Uh, for the Japan Belgium game, so tough to be at towards the end. But uh, yeah, and I've been trying to. Uh, I, I, I my main focus was to watch uh, every Colombia game uh, with with Colombians, and that's been uh, that's uh, was successful and fun up until the the game against Inglaterra. Yeah, who uh, ruined all the good times? <laughs> who ruined my my? I've been Colombia my entire life. The last tw- uh, twenty two days, uh, as, uh, as, as our listeners know on the podcast. Uh, yes, so th- that's been my main focus to definitely at least catch uh, at a bar of at least you know the the big in New York we have the luxury of we can go to we can go to Brazil basically and we can go to Colombia we can catch a lot we of we can them. go to Uruguay we can, yeah so it's a it's a nice luxury we have I actually filmed the show for Thrillist which is up now on uh, YouTube not to plug anything but the, no, the away, show is about away. The show is where in New York. It's called Devoted. Like where in New York is the best place to watch the World Cup. So we went to there's a there's a steakhouse called Boca Juniors, and the whole place is just it looks like a Boca Juniors clubhouse inside, and it's it's an Argentinian steakhouse. And uh, we tried to film a show there, and I got threatened with knives a lot. Uh, there's a lot steak of knives. real yeah, there's a lot of real Barra Brava fans uh, there with uh, you know La Dose tattooed on their arms who did not want to be on camera. Interesting. All I noticed, right um, I saw you at, I saw, I saw an episode of Thrillist. It was good. You were at Banter, I believe, uh, yeah, talking the England to one. some England fans. Yeah, and there was one gentleman who was very intense. Oh, his shirt was off. He was singing. He screamed the national anthem the entire time. He didn't <laughs> sing it. He was like, if not everyone here is English, I'll show you what the national anthem is. My my only complaint with that episode is whoever edited it and posted it put uh, where to watch the UK and the World Cup. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <gasps> This is England. Yeah, yeah. If it was the UK, they would win it all because you'd have Gareth Bale. You'd have Aaron Ramsey. No, no. This is just England. My hope is that that guy was actually from Connecticut as well, just to really drive it home. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when we go on tour, we will be getting things right. Mm -hmm. Um, So we wanted to ask you guys. Speak for yourself, gentlemen. Yeah, Yeah, you've seen our tweets, right? (laughs) We want to ask you guys. actually, Actually, I do want to ask you a question about tweets first. Were you all just going back and forth riffing with the Hamez meme today? Or was that uh, ju- just one of you? Whenever you see a run, like, whenever you see one, like, meme that's, like, well-written and very funny on its own. That's Christian. And just perfect. That's Christian. <laughs> when you see a thousand of them, a lot of grammatical errors, that's me. <laughs> I was, there's something called alternate side parking in New York. We have to sit in your car for an hour and a half because the sweeper might come by. 
And that's what I was doing, and I got really bored, so I just <laughs> went off. <laughs> and, and, and that's perfectly indicative of uh, our comedy style, so you'll see that on the tour. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So for, for listeners who don't know, we are all of us, um, and uh, Michael Majid and some other people are joining us. Um, we are going on tour. It's the World Cup Comedy Tour, despite Tyler and I never having done any comedy um, so we all been on tour so we wanted to <laughs> we wanted to ask you guys we're assuming you've been on tour before right so we basically oh. want to we want to ask you questions like what is it like on the road we were going to ask you these questions anyway but i wanted to ask you on the show so listeners can hear it um as well so i want to ask a specific question like maybe i'm um, a little concerned that i believe christian is already laughing i don't really know what to make of that <laughs> so yeah what's so many stories <laughs> there's so much to learn what's the thing we should be looking forward to in terms of touring and what's the thing we should be terrified of okay well well terrified bed bugs uh yeah, that's fair oh, and yeah. you've already hit home okay yeah uh I'm we're gonna itching. be staying in some what they call comedy condos but uh every comedian knows they're just dens of torture they are <laughs> the most disgusting my favorite story it's where they is filmed uh, the series saw every yeah. single movie was filmed in a comedy yeah <laughs> and they actually had to wipe some of the blood off the wall just to be like this just looks too unreal in here <laughs> It's almost too scary. Uh, there generally you'll see like pots and pans with like weeks old, you know, mac and cheese in them. Uh, you know, there's just the fridge stinks. Uh, <laughs> the freezer is hot. The fridge is cold. Uh, <laughs> you, you may have those two things confused. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait till you get there. Uh, the um, one of my favorite stories is Robert Kelly, very funny comedian, also has the You Know What Do podcast, which we've both been on. What he likes to do is he'll leave a dirty sock inside the pillowcase uh, and he'll tuck it in there. And then when the next comedian comes, typically we all know each other. So he'll text the next comedian, check your pillow <laughs> like the day he comes in. Generally, comedians will fly in the Thursday morning if they have Thursday through Sunday. And they'll be like, oh, there's a dirty sock in here. And that's how you know no one cleaned the comedy condo. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, is it, this is so, like the Van Halen brown M and M's thing. Yes, oh, yeah. Robert only Kelly's way song. grosser. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but wait, yeah. wait. Let, let's let's be real here. I was told we are not staying in comedy condos. That we got hotels. Have I been misled? Okay, I was under the impression we were going to stay in one or two comedy condos. So if we're staying in hotels, we're much better off. Ooh, yeah. okay. You know how they say everything in a hotel is covered with like semen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just imagine a comedy condo is worse <laughs> because you know where it came from. <laughs> so, so like. Purell, then? Is that what we're emphasizing here for the first part of this tour? That's right. Cover your body in okay. it all while right. you go to bed. <laughs> I will tell you this much, though. If we were staying in comedy condos, bring your own pillowcase. And I, not, to, not to talk about pillowcases, but every time I stay at a comedy condo, I get a vicious cold. And I have a pretty good immune system. So hmm. uh, it's because the, the pillowcases are just disgusting. I'll also just say Alexis does not have a good immune system. I don't know where he gets that from. <laughs> He's right. I have a great immune system. Good point, Christian. <laughs> uh, but, the, but the other thing I would uh, keep uh, keep in mind is that usually – when you are on a tour with uh, any group of people doing anything for a long amount of time, you will end up hating each other. Uh, I did a tour. This one's a little different, but I did a, a tour through Ohio where I rode a bicycle from Cincinnati to Cleveland with three other comedians. And uh, and I, I'm not much of a cyclist, but we did eight shows along the way. And it was it was in, it was like intense. It was difficult. But the, the thing that kept me motivated to go was like the, I knew I, that I had a comedy show to go to and I had it, I had to get there on time. <laughs> but two of the comedians that were on on the tour uh, were everybody was a better cyclist than me, but two of them smoked. So they would they would be half an hour ahead of me. And when when I would catch up to them, they would be smoking, waiting for me. And it made me hate them more than anyone I've ever hated <laughs> in my life. <laughs> so that, that's a good question. So uh, well, we've hung out a couple of times. Yeah, we've we've had phone calls. We've texted. We've talked to you on the show. But we don't know each other that that well. Right. I would say we're in the early stages of a blossoming friendship here. How how can we not ruin that over the course of the tour? What's the thing that we would do to really make you guys hate us? I mean, apart, apart from cycling ahead and then smoking. <laughs> You'd have to stay away from us if you don't want to, uh, to us all hate each other. Uh, just <laughs> spending it, that much time with anybody, you know, you're gonna. I would say the best thing to do is not tell us how much more successful you are than us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The don't ever let us see your download numbers, <laughs> and I think we'll be fine. Uh, I, to be honest, when you're on the road, I think you know I'm I'm a very different person than Christian. I I'm like very afraid of alone time. 
You know, I very yeah. rarely want alone time. I like to be out talking to people. So whenever I'm in a city, I go I go try some good food while I'm there. I want to go talk to people. Maybe I'll catch like a Premier League game if it's early in the weekend or an MLS game if there's like a bar where I could watch it. Things like that. I'll go do that. And I want to meet the locals. I, I talk to Uber drivers. I'm like a little kid who didn't get hugged enough. You know, <laughs> Christian, I think you're a little bit different. You like your you 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 sort of like your alone time. Yeah, I, I need uh, I need that to maintain some of my sanity. But I'm not I'm not non social but definitely the, the the amount of time Alexis needs uh, to have like attention paid to him is not even close to what I need. <laughs> no, we'll be driving. We drove to the videos up on our YouTube. We drove to Montreal and an hour and a half in, I straight up just without how, none of us said a word. I just yelled, are you even going to talk to me? <laughs> he was just sitting on his computer and he's like, what do you want me to talk to you about? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm driving. You guys talk to me. You know, Alexis, also, Alexis is a very, uh, he has, uh, you know, uh, mani- I don't know how do you say it, manias. Like, you have things that you need things a certain way, you know, and I have no real interest in, like, uh, you know, sort of placating to the things that you need in your life. Because I was like, so, like, like driving. Driving's one thing where Alexis will drive everywhere. He, he, he. I don't want anyone else to he drive. He doesn't want anyone else to drive. Even you can offer a million. You all, times. you all suck at driving. I don't know the two of you, but I promise you I'm better uh, than Alexis you. Alexis is the worst. <laughs> he has the, uh, this insane, I wouldn't even call it road rage. It's, it's road uh, just simmering hatred of other drivers. <laughs> yeah, just a, a road mal temperament. Uh, just <laughs> constantly, everyone is, uh, he, he is, I think that's why, you know how some drivers uh, get a little tired uh, driving long distances? What what keeps Alexis awake is that blood hot rage <laughs> yeah. of how other drivers are driving. My wife says this statement at least three times a week. You know, this is why your blood pressure is up. It's because you're <laughs> driving. You get angry at everybody. I don't understand why you're like this. And so, I just think if people listened to me, maybe they'd be better drivers. <laughs> so Christian sometimes will drive through New York City without, like, to an airport without even using ways. And then he's like, oh, I can't believe there's traffic here. I grew up in Brooklyn. And this I, is the way I'm used to driving. And I'm sitting on the phone. I'm like, well, if you listen to ways, which, you know, tells you the traffic, would have told you to avoid this way but god forbid you use the internet for yes. the technology it's called ocd yeah <laughs> so, yeah. But, but here's my question then is like is it uh alexis do you actually want christian to ask you questions or is it always going to be punctuated by you screaming at other drivers <laughs> I'm look. I may interrupt whatever you're saying right. by telling other drivers how they could be better. Just making notes I like over to here. Say constructive criticism, uh, but yeah, I want people to talk to me if I'm driving. You know, you can't be the only one in the car. And just not saying a word to me. I mean, that's insanity. He's just a bad co-pilot, is what it is. I guess so. All right, so let's get into um, the actual onstage part of the show because people who may be coming to see all of us on tour might want to know how that works, right? So Taylor and I are curious. We both sort of independently came up with this very similar question. Um, when you go on stage and you look at the crowd, do you read the room in some way or do you just do what you do and cross your fingers? We might both have different answers for this. I, yeah, I would say for me, uh, I mean, we're both going to do stand up on the show, so there, there's going. I, I think every show is going to be a little bit different in in the the type of jokes that we're going to make. So there's going to be partially the things that we want to do and, and the jokes that we want to make, and then maybe something a little bit more tailored to the particular city that we're in. So if we're in Columbus, you know, the pre court jokes are coming out. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be yes, hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to tell them we're going to sw- halfway through the show. We're going to go to Austin and finish the show. Uh, <laughs> so it's going to be some fun ro- little roasting. Yeah. Uh, and we're, it, but it's going to be different. I, and it, but we both read the room differently, too. I think because I know how to read. I right. Mean, that's, a diff- that's the main. <laughs> well, I just I like the room read to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's an audio book uh, version of that. Uh, for me, I think. I'm probably I like to antagonize the crowd a bit. I like to I like to annoy them a little bit. I like to see where the line is Um, sometimes right up front. So I like to go up and maybe poke at them a little bit and see, like, have I gone too far? But I think for most of us, the reason the host goes up and does a little bit of crowd work is because that's where you get a sense of the crowd. So Mm. I tend to listen into when the, the host is on stage or sort of here for the reactions, you know, and uh, kind of gauge, all right, here's what I, here's where the line is with this crowd. You know, crowds become like one unit after a while. So you can hear, okay, here's what they, they don't like. Here's what they're afraid to laugh at. Here's what they, they want, or maybe they want something a bit more raucous or things like that. So I tend to listen to the host a bit, but I think Christian and I might be swapping who goes first or second. So if Christian were to go before me, I'd listen in. And if I were to go first, I might 
you know, poke and prod the crowd a bit more, maybe take the temperature and then sort of, you know, I always like to give the person who goes up after me a better idea of what the crowd is like than before when I got up. So uh, I am curious about this. Is it just a convention of movies? Like if, if say Alexis, you open and it goes well, as you walk off stage, have you ever said to Christian like, oh, it's a hot audience out there? Or is that just a thing that exists in television and movies to let us know that the comedian should expect a good audience? Oh, we do. We do say okay. that. And part of it is because then if that person bombs, it's their fault. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite things to be like, wow, that crowd is great. And then they go up in their first two jokes, don't well, and be like, don't do well. And be like, well, I guess you're ruining that crowd. You know, it was great until you got up. Sometimes uh, we do do shows where like uh, somebody goes up before us and it's like the temp- yeah, like you, you feel like, oh, th- that didn't really go so well. But you're like, you know what? I'm going to pop this crowd. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Every comedian thinks like, wow, this crowd sucks. Because I haven't got up yet. Like, that's the, that's the confidence you need in order to perform stand-up. So I think when you guys get up, you'll be able to read the room. But what you guys are going to be doing is a little different, right? You're obviously not going to be doing stand-up because you're not stand-up comics. So for some to some degree, you're going to be doing a lot more audience interaction. I think that's going to draw the crowd in. So even if Christian and I go up and bomb terribly, uh, you guys will still be able to have a better chance of winning that crowd over because you're going to speak to them. Yeah, so what we're hoping to do is um, have some of the guests up and do sort of a quick like, you know, panel interview and then maybe do some soccer trivia games. But I'm also wondering, I'd be meaning to ask you this, you know, um, off air, but I'm going to ask you on air. Would you guys be willing to also sometimes or regularly join us on stage for some of the trivia? Because I've got to warn you, there will be some non-NYCFC uh, trivia questions. Yeah, again, we're fans of the whole league <laughs> and American soccer. And again, I'm a massive Arsenal fan. He's an Everton fan. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we were just talking about this before we got on uh, the, the call with you guys. We would absolutely love to be on stage. I think there should be something where all of us are on stage together. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. All right, we, we just didn't want to... Because um, one thing I was wondering is whether you think of it as, as work or fun. And I, I was worried that if we asked you to join us on stage after your set was over, you'd be like, what, you, what this British guy's asking us to work overtime? What's this? This, wasn't, this wasn't in my rider. Yeah. 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 I'm going to walk up with my contract in hand. Up, yeah. up, 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 up. I'm, i got to go home and check for socks. So, yeah, Daryl, exactly. Daryl can uh, attest to, like, I instigate just a tiny little bit, and I am now. I shouldn't say this. Like I should have just kept this to myself. But now all I want to do is when we do full panel things, I want to make it a point to just not ask Alexis questions and see how long it'll take <laughs> for him to just start being like, "Where's my question?" <laughs> or or just me interrupting anyway. <laughs> I, I hope there's there's not a table on stage because he will flip it. <laughs> yeah. And if I have a steering wheel in my hand, everyone's getting yelled at. <laughs> oh, I want to ask you about the the first show, right? Omaha, Nebraska. Um, we've been told there's some connection with the Bug Eaters, and you guys sponsor the Bug Eaters. I genuinely have no idea um, what's going on there. So could you explain a bit of the, the background for that? Okay, so uh, we – who reached out? It was uh, uh, Jonathan Kalura, right? Jonathan uh, Kalura, the owner. The own, So there's a, the owner of Bug Eaters FC is uh, from Nebraska, and he was I, – I, I think uh, he owned a team in, in fourth division uh, in England. In England. And, and he – yeah, he sold that team, but then he was like, you know what? I want to do this uh, where where I'm from. I well, he to- also purchased the third division team. Okay. So he sold the fourth, purchased the third, but he also wanted to do it at home. He wanted to have a team at home. Yes. So uh, so he, he was uh, starting this team, which just just began a couple months ago. And he – I don't know how he heard our podcast. He, he yeah. came across it some way. He became – a fan of the show. We never once said the word Nebraska in three years. <laughs> okay, you can look at the, the SEO. It never came up once. Never came up. So he reached out to us. He was like, hey, I, I really like the show. And then he, I think he just sent us like a, a hat and a T-shirt. Uh, a couple yeah, of things. he wanted to get us some of the information once the logo came out. Yeah, so before the team actually started playing, he just uh, started sending us some stuff. So then we started looking it up a little bit, talking about the team a little bit more and, and in you know it, its inception. And then... After, uh, a, a, I think, a, maybe a month or two before the team was starting, he was like, hey, guys, I'm just a fan of the show, and I've been telling people in Nebraska, would you mind if uh, we put your logo on the team's sleeve? Uh, and- so Christian and I were hugging and crying. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, if you look up, you go to BugEatersFC.com, you look up any of their, uh, their the, 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 the photos of any of their games, all their players have a Cooligans logo on their sleeve. So Nebraska is repping. 
the Cooligans heart. And we we look at it as a partnership. I mean, we're we're first of all we're flattered and honored that anyone would ever even want to put our logo. I mean, you know, people in Nebraska have half a soccer ball and half a pizza pie on their arms, <laughs> which is insanity to me. But uh, we we see it as a partnership. We talk about the team and we try to, you know, I know that a lot of American soccer fans, I'm sure we'll meet some of your fans that feel this way, uh, you know, aren't fans of MLS because they think, you know, it's stopping lower leagues from developing. The point of our show is to increase sort of the the fandom of American soccer and, and to build that audience. And we think that it, it has to involve all levels. So we try to talk about the lower leagues a little bit. We try to at least tweet about it and share their information. There's a team in California named the Oxnard Guerreros, which we joke around that that's my, like, very smart brother, <laughs> Oxnard Guerreros, on the show. And, like, when I make a dumb mistake, I was like, well, Oxnard would, <laughs> would have got that correctly. And they sent us some, some merch and stuff. We wear it on the show. When they had their open tryouts, we tweeted about it. And the lady messaged us back saying, yo, thank you so much. You got a bunch of people out here, um, you know, that we couldn't have got ourselves. So we try to help across the board. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I would also say even even for me personally, it's helped me uh, understand lower league uh, football uh, across the across the U.S. That I, I never really understood how much uh, time people are investing and, and money and love and support in, in a lot of these uh, uh, cities that, you know, they may not have MLS teams near them, but they still want to support uh, grassroots soccer. So uh, but see, getting to see that kind of uh, love and support and seeing how, what people do, uh, you know, whether it be like four or five hundred people that, that that go support uh, bug eaters or or in other, you know, uh, you know, Richmond kickers, clubs. The, the team you guys are associated with. I mean, that's you know, it's big for us to do the same thing. Given the, the last couple of years since we've been doing this podcast, you know, I only I think I was much more of a casual fan where I just knew about top league football, Premier League, MLS and all this other stuff. And now I get to learn about and be more invested in in the growth growth of lower league soccer. So it's been it's been great for me. So that's that is great, genuinely. But now I can't help thinking that Total Soccer Show needs to sponsor a rival UPSL team or maybe another <laughs> team in Nebraska, and we can have the podcast derby. Oh, that would be great. That would be. I mean, the the bloodshed. I can't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who needs pro rel when you can have a podcast derby? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Podcast derbies or the the podcast classico. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, did you guys have anything you wanted to ask us about the tour before before we wrap it up here? Yeah, are you guys afraid of bombing? <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but we're always afraid of bombing, so that's why we put a lot of work into every show to make sure we're fully prepared. How's that for a confident answer? That's pretty great, actually. That's a pretty great answer. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not worried about uh, Taylor and Daryl uh, being prepared. That's uh, no, that way way too prepared. In fact, they're going to rewatch tape of those shows we do, <laughs> and then analyze it on their podcast <laughs> afterwards. Um, one of the things that one piece of advice I do want to give you guys, and this was yeah. a piece of advice that I got when I first started. Um, when we did uh, the first time I ever did a private event where it's not a traditional stand-up show, um, the guy looked at me who I was working with who had done a bunch of these before, and he goes, "Hey, you're not going to hear the type of laughter you hear at a comedy show. You're not bombing. They're all going to come up to you afterwards, and they're going to tell you you're great." No matter what I tell you, you're going to think you're bombing the entire time and you're going to try harder and harder and you're not going to get the reaction you want. And afterwards, they're all going to come up to you and tell you that you were amazing and they loved it and they want to come see you perform. The entire time I thought I was bombing, I was sweating up there. It was one of the worst things I've ever done. I'm like, why am I even in this business? This sucks. I'm going back to corporate America. And at the, <laughs> afterwards, I couldn't get out of there because I was signing so many autographs. So I will tell you. We plan our material out to get a certain amount of laughs every minute or so. It's kind of what we do at clubs and it shows you're going to get a different reaction. But I guarantee you people are going to love what you guys do. Uh, we've seen you live in Philly. And I know you guys came to see us and put a little bit of pressure on us to be funny. We came and saw you at your at your uh, I guess more of a trivia thing that yeah. you guys did. And we were blown away. We thought you guys were great. And it gave us both confidence to go on the road with you guys and vice versa from what you told us. So I think you guys are going to do great. So I'd rather give you advice than ask you any questions because I kind of feel like you guys are set and ready to go. Yeah, I, I, just to add to that, the I think the, the reason we're doing this is, is uh, I mean, it, it, for this uh, sort of selfish reason of us to like work together and like we, we can get to meet your fans and you can get to meet our fans. Uh, but more than anything, you guys being your genuine selves, uh, you don't have to pretend to be comedians. You guys are you guys are funny on your own. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think I saw it was there was some uh, oh somebody tweeted at both of us and, and said uh, and sort of described both of us and they described us as NYC comedians and uh, uh, Total Soccer Show as two two guys who do dad jokes but <laughs> know so much about soccer yeah they're like they know how to analyze the sport and 
I think they said we're two New York stand-up comedians to talk about soccer, and it's exactly what you think it's going to sound like. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to us, I was like, yeah, that's exactly what we want to be. <laughs> like, you sh- you guys aren't going to try to pretend to be comedians. I'm never going to try to pretend to be smart. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know exactly who I am. I'm going to go up there and do what I do best. But And even I think the bigger uh, picture or the bigger goal and, and what I would hope out of this tour is, uh, is that this is, this is something incredibly unique. And no, no one's ever done this. No before. one's ever done anything like this. And the American soccer fan has been so heavily neglected from 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 almost most aspects of of the comedy world or like entertainment world. Uh, they're they're heavily heavily ignored, and we can kind of change that perception of what the uh, uh, the American soccer fan kind of enjoys and what kind of uh, events they would support. So you know, uh, for to me, I'm like all of us are are joining together. Uh, you know, to really do something uh, uh, important and maybe we'll, we can change the soccer landscape to some degree. Even yeah, what if we're it's, doing is historic. It's his, history is being made. <laughs> can we close with a bit of trivia? Go for it. Oh, boy. Okay. Do you guys know the order of the cities we are visiting? Yes. All right. So where are we going first? First is no. He, Alexis just pointed at my phone to yeah. So I was like, we can't, we we can't, can't have cheating. No, we're, we're not cheating. We're not cheating. I'm not doing I, it. I said it because I don't want to cheat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he didn't have to throw me under the bus, but go for it. Uh, it gives you a little idea of what the road's going to be like. Uh, yeah. I'll start with Omaha, Kansas City, yep. Richmond, Virginia Beach. Yeah, yeah. Those are four different cities, just yeah. for people who are confused <laughs> by the, the yeah. emphasis, the emphasis that uh, Alexis put on it. What do you want me to say, comma? You want me to take a break between <laughs> these things? Yeah. Uh, things are fast in this city. All right. Uh, then it's, I believe, Columbus, Cincinnati. Other way around, but yes. Oh, Cincinnati, Cincinnati Columbus. Columbus. Then yep. Chicago. Yep. Then Ch- and, and, then and then TBD. Yeah, then we're going to TBD. Well, actually, we announced it on our show already. <laughs> <laughs> Can I assume TBD is ATL? Uh, yes, it is, baby. We're going to uh, Atlanta. Yeah, that's exciting. I've never been to Atlanta, so this is big for oh, me. Wait till you guys. We got we got places to eat, boy. <laughs> we gonna we gonna put some seasoning in that and English body. <laughs> clubs to visit. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, not all this food is boiled. I hope you're ready for it. <laughs> well, it actually, technically, is boiled, just in lard. <laughs> Well, I, I look forward to it. Um, <laughs> Christian and Alexis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. And we will see you very soon. I can't wait. It's going to be great. So those were the Cooligans, Alexis Guerreras and Christian Palenko. We will be spending about two weeks on the road with them straight after the World Cup. Lovely. Lovely. Variety is the spice of life. It is. We get one day to ourselves, all right? July 16th before we get launched on tour. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> We should not see each other. Gonna sleep day. all day. Yeah, me yep. too. <laughs> so again, if you're interested in coming to see us, I've been told tickets are selling well, but there are some tickets still available. It's WorldCupComedyTour.com. Please get your tickets ASAP. And for those who've been asking about uh, other cities that we aren't going to, yeah. I believe the talk theoretically was that if this goes well, then it gets expanded down the road yes. or maybe in the near future. So mm-hmm. uh, all the more reason for more people to buy tickets. And maybe if you want to help us promote it, mm-hmm. if, you, if we're not coming to your city, but you want us to come to your city eventually, a thing you could do is just tell people about it on Twitter, promote WorldCupComedyTour.com. Excuse me, WorldCupComedyTour.com. Definitely know the URL before <laughs> yeah. you start recommending. Let people know about it, and then that becomes successful, and then the next time round, we come to your town. Is that a good plan? Yeah. yeah. Next time round, we come to your town. Next time round, we come to your town.com. Slight rhyme. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, once again, WorldCupComedyTour.com. One of the sponsors of the World Cup Comedy Tour. Uh-huh. Is Roughneck Scarves, that is who correct. are also sponsors of the Total Soccer Show. And as I understand it, there will be merchandise available. There will be a Cooligans Total Soccer Show custom World Cup Comedy Tour scarf via Roughneck Scarves available for sale um, at every show. And How's think, about that? I think my favorite part of the scarf was when uh, Michael Majid, who was doing the design for it, Gave us, like, the demo scarf and explained how it was going to be totally different. The Cooligans agreed. We missed all of that explanation and proceeded to list all the things that we wanted to change yeah. before. He was like, did you see where I said yeah, I was going to do all that? We were not helpful. We're good at reading. We were not, we were not helpful in we're that smart. situation. My apologies to Michael, <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> Michael Majid. Um, but, yeah, the scarf will be available. It's via Roughneck Scarves. So thank you to Roughneck Scarves for, mm-hmm. for taking care of that for us. But also, if you go to roughneckscarves.com, you can buy all kinds of World Cup team scarves. You can even get ready 
for the 2019 World Cup. Yep. The Women's World Cup, it's in France next year. The US Women's National Team will almost definitely qualify. We're pretty confident the US Women's National Team will qualify. And they have, I think, in partnership with the US Women's National Team Players Association, they have player-specific scarves. I showed you the page earlier, mm-hmm. right? Very excited for this. If you want to support the US Women's National Team at the 2019 World Cup, you can go to roughneckscarves.com right now and you can choose a player-specific scarf. Taylor, I've been buying you time while I let you think. Which scarf would you buy? Oh, I'm, it, I knew 100%. It's Julie Ertz. Oh, well, I would have gone Julie Ertz too. Of course you would. Why would you go Julie Ertz? Because I think Flash players can be Flash, but they can have like you know moments where they don't perform. They can have moments where they get injured because they're too Flash. Julie uh-huh. Ertz, I don't think she can be injured. I, I, I think <laughs> she is sort of like uh, indestructible in yeah. all of her challenges. I'm going to knock on wood so that she doesn't miss the World Cup due to injury. <laughs> uh, but I think you are the one who first swayed me to like realizing how good she is, both as a defender but stepping into midfield and facilitating attack. Slide tackles. Yep. Mm-hmm. Slide tackles galore. I think, I, haven't, I actually haven't seen the recent, most recent US Women's National Team game. I think she's essentially helped Jalelis solve the tactical problem yep. by being the, def- she's moved out of centre-back and mm-hmm. she is the defensive midfielder. She is the, the Casemiro of the US Women's National Team. And I will but add, with more slide tackles. Yeah, and I will add that uh, she is a world champion. Uh, her husband, Zach Ertz, is a current Super Bowl champion. So if they ever have a child, I assume that will one day be our overlord. So it's just good to have a <laughs> scarf now that endorses the Ertz's. <laughs> I guess since you you chose Juliet, I would go Megan Rapinoe's yep. scarf. Always Megan Rapinoe, one. to me, is the heart and soul of the U.S. women's national team. I feel like I knew you were going to go there, and that's yeah. why I tra- tried to cut that out, argument out from under you before you made it by talking <laughs> about Flash players. Well, the good news is there's so many good players on the U.S. WNT. That's can, very true. You can take your pick. Yep. Also, if you do go to roughneckscarves.com and buy a U.S. women's national team scarf, you can get 20% off the price if you use discount code Total Soccer Show, all one word. Don't put spaces in it like I just did. Total Soccer Show, all one word for 20% off at roughneckscarves.com. Thank you to Roughneck Scarves for sponsoring today's episode of the Total Soccer Show. And thank you to everyone from the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network who sent in scouting reports. If you are not familiar, Total Soccer Show Scouting Network is one of the ways we support the show. It's one of the ways we ask listeners to support the show. You go to totalsockershow.com slash join. Um, You support the show with a monthly contribution, monthly financial contribution, and we add you to the TSS Scouting Network. We make you a scout. We assign you a talented young player to keep your eyes on and send us reports. We have 10 reports ish to read to 10 ish <laughs> reports to read today i didn't properly count that's what's happening i figured but i recognize roughly 10 when i see it <laughs> taylor would you like to get us started who's up first that's outstanding up first is ben richards scouting efren alvarez the 16 year old mexican-american striker for la galaxy 2 los dos Efrain uh, spent the last few weeks training with the Mexican U-17s, spending some time with the LA Galaxy Academy, and turning 16. He's been busy. He returned to Los Dos to start in a 5-3 victory over Seattle Sounders 2, where he remembered to turn off his cell phone and then scored two more goals. He's better uh, than me. This gives Efra eight goals, good for joint third in the USL in seven matches, over 484, 484 minutes played. Whew, uh, easy for Daryl to say. Uh, which is ridiculous for anyone, let alone someone who just turned 16 last month. Well done, Efren Alvarez. And worth noting, he has not closed the door on the US under 17s, under 20s, or senior national team. Just- I know. I noticed that when I like do the scouting reports, I think I list him as like Mexican striker because uh-huh. when they declare, that's when I go that route. Uh-huh. You kept it open, and I well, appreciate that. I read the Portonorio story mm-hmm. for the Athletic where yep. he said, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying sure, no sure. to either right now, but I'm right now I'm with the Mexican U17s, but he's not cap tied yet. Yeah. I should clarify that mine is not like a statement of intent when it comes to like, oh, he's cho- chosen Mexico now. It really is just laziness. <laughs> and there are so many players who are eligible to represent like seven different national teams that at yep. a certain point, you just got to make a decision. Here's the thing with Efren Alvarez, though. Mm-hmm. Even if he ends up choosing Mexico, Keep watching him because he's just going to be a delight to watch play soccer, but more of a delight for us if he wears the U.S. national team jersey. Yeah, that checks out. Can't wait for him and Jonathan Gonzalez to start for Mexico at the next World Cup. That would be hard to watch. Um, Sam Kreef is scouting Ezekiel Barco. I'll probably pronounce that incorrectly. Ezekiel. Ezekiel Ezekiel Mm -hmm. Barco, the 19-year-old Argentine attacker for Atlanta United. Here's Sam's update. Ezekiel Barco was named to the MLS All-Star Fan 11 along with five of his teammates. That that social media vote is good in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, The MLS All-Stars plays Juventus in Atlanta on August first mm-hmm. and a couple of days before we'll be doing um, a World Cup comedy tour show yeah. we'll be at the MLS All-Star game I just want to say congratulations for everybody for voting in the final MLS fan All-Star poll before they change the format next year 
Is that what's going on? I, I would assume so, given that there are five Atlanta players I mean, in the maybe, starting 11. They maybe deserve it. Atlanta killing it. I mean, you're not wrong. I just, I believe I'm correct in saying that most, like, there's so many jokes. I, I think Matt Doyle has tweeted several of them that are like, reminder, you can't do MLS fan polls and have Atlanta in there because Atlanta will win. That's how it works. <laughs> uh, Richie Garcia scouting 21-year-old American midfielder Emerson Heinemann of AFC Bournemouth, which put, makes them... i put the AFC in just for you. I know you did because they're first in the table in the Premier League when as a result. It, when you do it. Correctly. Uh, the Sun reported that Emerson Heinemann will go on a six-month loan to newly promoted championship, championship team Wigan Athletic. Uh, in my opinion, says Richie, it's a bad move to go to a team in the championship that will be fighting to stay up. Yeah, Richie was I, I would worried agree that, with that he was worried that Emerson Heinemann might not get enough minutes uh, for Wigan. But I would I would say he's not getting many for Bournemouth either, right? He just got a quick a quick spell at the end of the season when Bournemouth were not too worried about their Premier League position. I think he wouldn't be going to Wigan unless there were minutes. I I'm mean, hoping. I would I would hope that, but I think I agree with Richie that you can get those situations when like a player isn't performing or getting minutes at a Premier League team, so then they get loaned out to a championship team, and it can be very much like, no, we're playing the same 11. If one of them gets hurt at some point, then maybe you're on the bench, but then you go back to your parent club, and it looks like, oh, you weren't even good enough to crack a championship yeah. team. No, thank you. Oh, Emerson Heinemann. I, this, I'm starting to watch this with concern. Um, at least so far, knock on wood, yeah. no preseason injury. Yeah. That's been his problem in recent years. Right? And, I'll, and I'll add a caveat, though. Unless the team that is struggling to survive in the league uh, has financial problems a la Bolton last mm-hmm. season and can't afford players, then it makes sense if you're, say, Anthony Robinson. There we go. Um, Steven Novak is scouting Niklas Sula, the 22-year-old German centre-back for Bayern Munich. And in this World Cup, briefly... Germany. Briefly. Steven says Niklas was the German player nutmegged by Tony Kroos on the first South Korean goal. Do you remember this? Kroos had the poke tackle. It went through Sula's legs. Not a great look for the youngster in his first World Cup start. And so far, his only World Cup start because he's got to wait another four years. Yeah, really? I was trying to find a silver lining there. Not much. Other Uh, than that, I guess he didn't play the ball. At least there's that. (laughs) Um, we've got Russell Look, Varner. Niklas, close your legs. True. Uh, close the door to your house. Uh, <laughs> Russell Varner scouting Alex Mendez, 17-year-old um, uh, midfielder for LA Galaxy Academy, Los Dos, and the United States. And can I also say, he may be the very, very good consolation prize if we lose the Efren Alvarez battle. You can and you have. Uh, since I last wrote in about Alex, uh, young Alex Mendez, things have happened, says Russell. He scored his first professional goal. Mendez went the full 90 for LA Galaxy 2 in their 5-3 win over Seattle Sounders 2. He played in a number 8 role and scored a beauty, beauty of a free kick, catching the keeper sleeping and beating him to the far side on a left-footed curler. Go on, Alex Mendez. Go on. Um, Gillian Avalon is scouting uh, two Birmingham City players, Ronan Hale and Jack Storer, two young strikers, except neither of them currently plays for Birmingham City. And here's why. Baby Ronan, Ronan Hale, has extended his loan at Derry City to the end of their season, keeping him closer to family until November. Derry play in the Irish League and it goes like March to November. I think, um, I think I'm correct in saying that Ronan Hale has a child. I don't know if you can be baby Ronan and have a baby. <laughs> you can be baby baby. Well, I don't know if that's allowed. So the baby's baby baby. I Ronan. might be wrong on that, but we'll see. <laughs> this also gives him the chance to play in the Europa League qualifiers while on loan. Woo. You want some trivia? Derry City is Derry, Northern Ireland. They play in the Republic of Ireland League. They I remember special that. special dispensation. We figured this out last time. Yeah. It was very confusing. I figured it out again today because I forgot our previous <laughs> conversation. As for Jack Storer, <laughs> Jack Storer is the other young striker Gillian was scouting. Birmingham City released him. So Jack Storer's Birmingham dream is over. Um, but Jack Storer has found a place at recently relegated Partick Thistle, which is in the Scottish Championship. They were relegated from the SPL to the Scottish Championship. That's, they do have an awesome name there. That's certainly a place. Keith Combach scouting. Marcelo Palomino, the 17-year-old American midfielder slash winger for the U.S. M&T U18s, Houston Dynamo U19s, and now Brazos Valley Cavalry FC. Wow. All right. Marcelo Palomino is on the move after a stellar year where Palo uh, made 25 appearances and a team-high 17 goals for the Dynamo U19s. He is signed for PDL team Brazos Valley Cavalry FC. So I did a bit of reading on this. I'm assuming that you can sign for Brazos Valley on a non-professional basis because that's what happens in the PDL, right? You go as a youngster, get some experience, all is good, and then you can go back to the Houston Dynamo Academy. Or college. 
or college. Oh, I forgot, yeah, 17, he's thinking about college, right? Manny Alcantara is scouting Junior Firpo, the 22-year-old left-back for Real Betis and the Dominican Republic. Manny says the Junio Firpo to Arsenal rumours have intensified over the last few days as Sports Illustrated pegged Junior Firpo as the possible replacement for Nacho Monreal, who himself is eyeing a move back to La Liga. The Sun and the Daily Star are also reporting on these rumours. No word yet on if Junior would be receptive to such a move. I would guess he would be, but I would guess that the Daily Star and the Sun aren't the best things to back up your transfer rumor. (laughs) Uh, Trent Breckel scouting Timothy Tillman, the 19-year-old left winger slash central attacking midfielder uh, for the USU 20s, sure. And Bayern Munich, too, sure. Why, sure. He was called up and he was there. Was he there? Yeah. Doesn't he still want to play for Germany? If... If Germany doesn't work out, he's definitely sampled the US under 20s. Gotcha. Timmy is on the move. A one-year loan deal from Bayern Munich 2 to newly promoted FC Nuremberg was announced today, July 2nd. Nuremberg's head coach, Michael Kolner, says it will be an exciting project. I think he means the development of Timothy Tillman. Ah, uh, football manager quotes project. in real life. <laughs> I mean, that's where they come from, right? Mm-hmm. This is when life imitates art. Um, Ryan Mazak is scouting Pione Sisto, the 23-year-old winger for Celta Vigo and Denmark. Ryan sent us a quick Pione Sisto at the World Cup update. Uh, Pione Sisto started in the final group stage game for Denmark against France, but was subbed out after 59 minutes of the most boring game of the World Cup so far. Didn't start in round, 16, round of 16 game versus Croatia. Subbed on in extra time. Didn't take a penalty. Denmark lost. Pione Sisto's World Cup is over. Yes, it is. It is. We expected more, right? We expected more of Pione Sisto at the World Cup. Yeah, I think we kept waiting for that breakout performance from mm-hmm. him. Similar to Forsberg for Sweden. I think we got it uh, yep. for Forsberg against Sweden. We never really did for uh, Sisto for Denmark. Yep. Let's hope we don't get too many more from Forsberg because they play England next. I would agree with that. Yeah. I'm um, fine with that. I mean, we're, we're totally neutral here, right? But I of definitely course. want England to win. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to everybody who sent in scouting reports. If you'd like to join the Scouting Network and support the show, it's totalsoccershow.com slash join again if you'd like to come and see us on tour it's worldcupcomedytour.com and Taylor if you'd like to see me tomorrow I'll meet you here at 10am to watch France, Uruguay and then Brazil, Belgium sound good? I'll be here at 9.55 or 10.04 oh, one or the wow. other that's, that's been my pattern this, this World Cup <laughs> we can always hit rewind on the DVD yeah. um, listeners Thank you for listening. Taylor, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. (laughs) And maybe the next day too. We will talk to you again tomorrow. 